Hi everyone, it's your professor, Teresa Vasquez, and I'm here today to talk about our first topic in our critical thinking course, Psych 110. Uh, the first topic we're going to cover for this course is finding reliable sources of information. And I wanted to start with this topic because this is something that you need to do for this class. And it's something that you need to do in life all the time. Being able to find sources of information that are actually correct and useful and can help you make good science-based decisions is going to be really important for your entire life. It's going to allow you to make better choices medically for yourself and for your family, psychologically, and in the way you take care of yourself. So it's a super important topic in critical thinking and in our lives. And so I just wanted to go over the outline for what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the general concept of information overload, because this is something that's really, really important in today's digital age where there are so many different sources of information. And then we're gonna talk about a related concept called cognitive overload. And there are different parts of the cognitive system that we're going to cover today include divided attention, executive control, how practice affects our uh, ability to do various behaviors, how our, a little tiny bit about how our memory works, including schemas and errors in memory, how emotion affects memory. And then finally, I'm gonna end by putting the ball in your court and talking a little bit about uh, how you can fight information overload with the resources that you're going to get in this class. Okay. So one of the critical uh, topics that you'll hear covered when people are talking about dealing with information in the digital age is this idea that we have too much information available, that the internet is just so vast, there's no possible way that people can process all of that information. And a very common term that's used for this idea is information overload that nowadays people have too much information to be able to digest it and make good decisions. The first time we see the term of information overload used is by a fellow by the name of Bertram Gross, and he wrote a book in the 60s called The Managing of Organizations. And that's where you first see that term appear in modern writing. But Alvin Toffler was really the person who kicked off the uh, use of that term in popular uh, science and in common usage. He wrote a book called Future Shock in 1970, and that, that term, information overload, was key to the events of the book, and so it became popular. But the idea of information overload is not new, not new at all. It's something that has ancient roots. And as soon as we see any written records, we start to see people talking about information overload. Uh, when writing was first invented, as soon as we started writing things down, we started saying, oh gosh, is writing things down going to make it so that we have too much information available? And then when the printing press was invented and books became something that were more, much more easily made and widely distributed, then that really caused a lot of concern and so on and so forth. Every time we've had a technological advancement uh, and that it has to do with recording information, people have worried that there's going to be too, in, too much information available for people to process. And so scientists started to study and see if this was true. Is it true that there can be too much information? Is it true that people can feel like there's too much information? And so one of the first studies that we see uh, become very popular and well-cited about this topic is in 1996 by Waddington, and he surveyed a whole bunch of managers, uh, managers at all the way from the introductory level up to the senior level, uh, over 1,300 managers all across different countries, the United States, uh, Great Britain, Australia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, all of these places, they interviewed people, and they made this 300 150 page report, this enormous report, it's pretty much a book. And they found that the 
stress associated with information overload was indeed a problem for a lot of people. Two thirds of man managers surveyed said that they've experienced tension with their colleagues because of information overload. They have had less satisfaction at their jobs. A third of people report that information overload has actually led them to suffer from ill health. And for senior managers, people who've been doing it even longer, it got worse. 43% of senior managers said that they actually experience physical problems associated with the stress of just too much information being available at their jobs. Uh, almost two thirds said that their personal interpersonal relationships with their significant others and their families were affected by information overload. 43% thought that information overload actually made it worse to make decisions at work and making them in a timely fashion. So too much information actually affects the work and 44% of the people surveyed, so that's a huge number, thought that organizing information, just putting it together in a way that it's useful, can often exceed the value that that information can provide for people in business. So essentially what a lot of managers were saying is that having too much information actually creates more problems than solutions sometimes. So... The term information overload is a popular science term. It's something that you will you can look up on Wikipedia, and that's actually one of your readings to read about information overload. But cognitive overload is a scientific concept. Cognitive overload is a term that you will see in scientific papers. So in scientific journal articles, in textbooks, and this kind of thing. And the idea of cognitive overload is that when we do many tasks, if we're doing too many things at once, it can overload our mental capacity. So for instance, there's something that you see just everywhere nowadays, the word ubiquitous, that means everywhere, is multitasking. You hear all the time about multitasking and how we are expected to do multitasking at our jobs, at our homes, everywhere practically, and how it can cause problems, how multitasking can sometimes overload our cognitive systems. And so researchers wanted to know why this was the case and how it works. And it turns out that we find that our attentional abilities, the human ability to pay attention, and for all animals, our ability to pay attention is limited. We have a limited capacity attention system. So that means that you have a certain amount of kind of attention energy or attention fuel or the amount of resources you have. You have a certain level in your system and you have to deploy them in the different places where attention is needed. So when we are researching multitasking in uh, cognitive science, we call it divided attention. So multitasking, again, is a layperson's term, is something that you see in popular science, but divided attention is the same thing in the scientific community. So divided attention means that you have to put your attention on more than one thing. And there are certain things that it seems very easy to divide our attention between. So for example, walking and talking is something that most people can do with no trouble. You can take a walk down the sidewalk, you can turn to your friend, you can have a conversation with them. And one thing, walking, you know, the old expression is walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? You can usually do those two things together pretty well. But there are other times when it seems really hard to divide our attention. So for example, texting and driving is extremely dangerous. And there have been many studies showing that accidents are created by texting and driving, really terrible accidents. And they're increasing as the rate of texting is increasing. Why is it so easy to walk and talk, but so difficult to text and drive? You have to have attentional resources to do all of those things. And if the resources you have are not up to the task, if the attentional resources you have are not enough to be able to do both tasks, you're going to fail at one or both tasks. And it turns out that the reason that certain things are easy to do as divided attention tasks and others are not, it has a lot to do with how similar the tasks are. So walking and talking 
involve totally different areas of your brain, totally different things that you do with your body, and they're really not related to one another in very many ways. Whereas texting and driving require the same attentional resources. Texting and driving require your visual attention, they require your cognitive attention, they require your ability to react, and so those two things are taking from each other. It's kind of like trying to listen to two different conversations at the same time. It's extremely difficult to do those two things or read a book and listen to somebody talking at the same time. You're going to fail on one or both of those because it's verbal information. And those two kinds of information, you have to process one channel or the other. You can't process both at the same time because they come from the same attentional zone in our brains. And so this brings us to the concept of executive control. Executive control is a huge topic in cognitive science, and our executive control abilities or our executive control functions are the parts of our brain that allow us to do the highest order of human thought. So this is our ability to have goal-directed behaviors. This is our ability to make plans. This is our ability to strategize. And this is really something that sets humans apart from any other uh, organisms that we know. We have, we can write an entire instruction manual of steps that you're supposed to follow to do certain behaviors. So executive control is something that comes up for people all of the time. And there are a lot of different ideas of exactly how executive control works in the brain. But there's one kind of theory, there's one kind of way of thinking that seems to be very plausible and that most cognitive sciences, scientists agree on. And this is the idea that most of the things we do every day are guided by habit. When we brush our teeth, when we make our meals, when we do our routines every day, we drive to work, we do whatever the things are that we have to do every day, feed our kids, whatever it is, we do these things largely by habit. But sometimes we don't want to follow our habits. Sometimes we want to try a new way of eating or we want to uh, try a new routine in the morning for getting our kids ready or we wanna drive a new way to work because we need to pick something up on the way. And the part of our brain that maintains our goals, I have to do one, two, three, four, is executive control. So it says, here are the things I need to do in a day, here are the things I need to do in the next hour or the next minute. So executive control is keeping our goals in mind but we also have to sometimes inhibit our habits. Sometimes our automatic behaviors, we wanna stop because we have reasons to stop them. So for example, one thing that is a really serious issue is that you've probably heard in the news about children being left in the car when their parents go into work or go into a store and it, terrible tragedies have happened where children have overheated and even died. And it seems almost unimaginable that a, a person could forget that their child was in the car, but it's actually very, very easy to do and understandable when you understand how executive control works. These situations almost always occur when the person is expected to deviate from their normal routine. So when a different parent is asked to drop the kid off at daycare, um, or when the parent has to, has a big meeting that they're really, uh, it's preoccupying their thoughts. So it's always, it, it almost always seems to be in these terrible tragedies that the person has a habit and that what happened on the day that the child was left in the car is that the person deviated from habit. But what they made was called a preservation error. And that's where you continue to reproduce your usual habitual behavior, even though you're not supposed to do that. The task has changed. You're supposed to drop your kid off first today, but instead you drive right to work because you're the parent who usually drives right to work. That's a preservation error. And we see it in 
normal humans all the time. Preservation errors happen to all of us. If you've ever been driving down the freeway and missed your exit, you made a preservation error. You kept going down the road, even though it was when you were supposed to exit. So preservation errors are very common. The part of the brain that is largely responsible for our executive control is our frontal lobe. So this is our, our two lobes at the front of our brain. And we find that people who have damage to that area have exactly what you would expect, problems with executive control. And preservation errors is one of these. You will see people with frontal lobe damage have more preservation errors than normal. Um, and when I say normal, I mean statistically normal. I don't mean that one person's normal and one person's abnormal. I mean the behavior is statistically normal. Okay, that's all I mean by that. I don't mean normal is good. I'm just talking about statistics. Okay, so you'll see people with frontal lobe damage, statistically speaking, have more preservation errors than people who don't have frontal lobe damage. We would call those people neurotypical. Um, and you also see something called goal neglect. And this is where a person has is supposed to have a goal in mind, but they have a hard time getting from point A at the beginning to point B, their goal. They have trouble planning. They have trouble figuring out how they're supposed to take all the turns they have to take to get to their goal. They have a hard time putting those things together step by step, making plans, uh, strategizing. And these, these um, kinds of issues you see also come up in people with attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So again, what, what's right in the ADD name is attention. It's an attention deficit. And so when you have an attention deficit, you have trouble with executive control. And so folks who have that kind of brain will make these preservation errors and experience goal neglect. And that's exactly what we're trying to do when we're trying to help you with your ADD is figure out how to lessen the impact of those errors and uh, have some more successful strategies. Okay, so now is a good time then to talk about the effects of practice because when we're dealing with ADD or ADHD, of course, there are a lot of different strategies we can use. We can use medication strategies. We can use therapeutic strategies. And one of the things you see in these therapeutic strategies are that you're going to practice different behaviors so that you can get better at them. And there's going to be an entire section of this class dedicated to practice because practice is really one of the most important concepts in cognitive science. And I have a lot to say about it. So we're going to come back to practice later on in the semester. But what I want to say now about practice is that when we practice things, when we practice behaviors, the more practice we do, the less attention we need to do that task after practice. So practice tasks, things that we practice over and over, we require less executive control, require fewer mental resources. The reason that habits become habits is because we practice them. We drive the same way to work every day. We brush our teeth in the same way every day. We fix our meals in the same way every day. All of these things that we do as habits are habits because we practice them so much. Think about learning to drive a car. At first, it requires a ton of attention to drive a car. If any of you remember the first time you ever went to drive a car, but this is true for any kind of task you might want to do. Let, you know, imagine learning to write. Imagine when you were a kid, imagine um, learning to play basketball or ice skate, okay? So let's say you wanna become, uh, you know, Serena Williams is a tennis player, or you wanna become um, a really, uh, Dominique Dawes is a gymnast or some, something like this. What do you have to do? You have to practice, okay? So come here, Zena. Come here, Zena. Come here, Zena. Here's my little barker. You guys can see her. Come here, Zena. Come here. Say hi to everybody. Hi, I'm Zena. I bark sometimes. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So 
when we first start to do any of these things, any of the, these behaviors, let's say driving a car, it's really hard. Every different part of it is really, really requires a lot of attention. You remember thinking about using your turn signals, thinking about adjusting your mirrors, thinking about holding the steering wheel, thinking about using the brake pedal and the gas pedal. And, you know, God forbid you should be trying to drive a stick shift. Then you have a, a whole separate set of things that you have to take into consideration. So there are all these different parts of the task of driving. And at first you feel almost overwhelmed because there are so many different parts to the task. You know, you take a tennis player who's just learning to play tennis. They have to figure out how to throw the ball and serve the ball and where they're holding their arms and where their legs are and all of these various things that go into the different parts of the task. And so at first our brain has to initiate each one of those steps separately. Okay, and you have to say to yourself, I'm going to adjust my mirrors. I'm going to put on my seatbelt. I'm going to check to make sure that, you know, I'm in drive and all of the various things that you have to remember. But after you've been driving a while, you just do it. You just get in the car. And as soon as you get yourself in the car, everything else follows after that. You automatically will turn on the the ignition. You automatically will check your rear view mirror, hopefully. <laughs> you automatically will put the car into reverse or drive or whichever way you need to go. After a while, you don't have to think about all the parts. And the same is true for Serena Williams. The reason that Serena Williams is so great is because she has practiced the behaviors so much, she doesn't have to think about them. And because she doesn't have to think about all the individual behaviors, she can put her mind on higher order things. She can be thinking about higher order strategies. She can be studying her opponent. She can be studying the arena where she's playing. She can take all of these other factors into consideration that a novice can't. So she has to use fewer attentional resources to play tennis than a novice does. However, the demand on attention can always end up being greater than the supply. There can always be something that makes it so that there's too many things that even Serena, the great Serena Williams, <laughs> cannot process all of them. And she misses that, that uh, return or whatever. I don't know tennis very well. I just know she's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so you can always have more attention needed than you have available. I, we all know of, you know, people who have been trying to text and drive or do other things and drive, and then they get in an accident because too much of their attention was taken by that other task. So why is this important to you in this class for critical thinking? Why am I talking about practice? Why am I talking about all these different aspects of your mental process and your brain? And it's because practice works to improve your executive control. The more you practice exerting executive control in certain ways, the easier it gets for you to do those behaviors again and again and again. Instead of falling into mindless habits, you'll fall into mindful habits. You will become automatic at processing things with a high level of executive control. So when you use your mental processes and practice them again and again and again, you get better at those too. So what you're going to do in this critical thinking class, guess what, is practice critical thinking. All of your tests are going to be geared towards critical thinking. All of your, especially your projects, are dedicated to critical thinking. You will have to practice the steps of critical thinking in order to complete your projects. And that's exactly the point. So we've been talking about various mental processes, but the one I want to talk about next is a really crucial mental process for critical thinking. And those are your memories process processes. Your memory processes go beyond just putting your attention on different sources of information. 
What your memories allow you to do is make sense of information. When you encounter new information, the reason it makes sense is because you're putting it in with all of your other memories. And the first step of making a memory we call either encoding or acquisition. You're encoding a memory or you're acquiring a memory. And that's where you're making the memory. You're putting it into your brain. You are taking the information from outside in the world and you're using your sensory systems to transduce it into neural information. And then that neural information is going to your brain where you can make memories. One of the things you have to do in order to make a memory is store that memory. And we call that storage. So once you put something into your memory, you encode it. Keeping it in your memory is called storage. So if you're going to come back and use that memory later, you have to store it. Well, what do you call it when you want to use that memory later? We call that retrieval. Going back and getting the memory. Refreshing that information in your head so that you can use it. Okay. So in this class right now, I'm teaching you about these three different parts of memory. And what you're doing right now is encoding the information as I talk to you. You're going to then hopefully store that information in your brain. And then later when you take an exam, hopefully you'll be able to reactivate that information in your brain and retrieve the information. Get it back so that you can use it for the exam. So <clears throat> cognitive scientists have studied memory quite a bit and they have uh, put different categories on memory that are very useful for understanding how memory works. Number one, because behaviorally, these things are meaningful, these categories are meaningful. Meaning, it seems that these are at least three different separate behaviors occurring because the outcomes are different and the experiences are different. But also, we see that different parts of the brain are active when we're using different levels of memory. So it seems that not only is the behavior a certain way, it seems that the brain area is active, reinforce the idea that this is something real in how memory works. So the first level of memory, most people don't even think of it as memory. And when I explain it to you, I think you can see why. We call it sensory memory. And sensory memory is <clears throat> where you take an information through your senses and that information stays in your senses for a few seconds, a second, a fraction of a second to a few seconds even after the actual stimulus itself is gone. So a very obvious example of this is when you stare at a light. If you move your eyes away from the light, you will still see that light persisting in your, uh, in your vision for a few seconds. That's a kind of sensory memory called iconic memory, visual sensory memory. And so you actually see the thing for a few seconds even after it's not there. You're, you're looking at a light in the dark and then the light turns off, but you can just see the after image of it for a few seconds. Or you might have this in your hearing where you hear somebody's voice and then after they talk, it's almost like you hear an echo of their voice uh, in your brain. That's uh, another kind of sensory memory for hearing, which is called echoic memory because it sounds like an echo. And you can even have this, you know, for your sense of smell and all your senses where it's kind of like that sensation persists, even though the actual stimulus is gone. I don't know if you've ever smelled a very strong perfume. And then even after you get way far away from the perfume, it still feels like it's in your nose. Um, that's another kind of sensory memory. So most people don't think of that as memory. When you think of a memory, you don't think of smell persisting in your nose for a few seconds, okay? But the next thing we talk about if you think about it for a second, most people can see how this is a kind of memory. And this is called your working memory. And your working memory is what you use when you're interacting with information, all right? So you just perceived some kind of information. So for example, let me say that I introduce myself to you or somebody, let's say you're at a bar and somebody introduced themselves to you. They say, hi, my name is Bob. Okay? You have that in your brain. That person's name is Bob. You just perceived it. And as long as you keep that active in your head, you say, hi, Bob. How are you, Bob? What's going on today, Bob? As long as you keep it in your brain, that information is active. 
And that's your working memory. Your working memory is the actual activity of your brain, of your neurons firing. That's your working memory. That's why they call it the working memory, because it's your brain working. It's your neurons firing. And when you do this, when you use your working memory, it has a limited capacity. You can only hold so much information in your working memory for so long. After a while, it will disappear. We call working memory fragile. So for example, if, you, if I say to you, uh, hi, my name is Bob, if a guy comes and introduces himself, hi, my name is Bob, if you don't pay attention to that name and try very consciously to store it, you're gonna forget it. And most people have had this exact experience. A person introduces themselves, you come back five minutes later and you can't remember what their name is. It went out of your working memory. The neurons were active for a while and then they stopped firing and uh-oh, I don't know his name anymore. Some people will still refer to working memory as short-term memory. Some scientists get really picky over short-term memory versus working memory. Most cognitive scientists today prefer the term working memory because they want to make sure that people understand that working memory is about the activity of your neurons, the status of your neurons, whether they're firing or not. It's not a place in your brain. Uh, working memory doesn't occur in a certain place in your brain. Oh, here it is, right at the middle level of the brain or something. No, working memory is the brain cells in your brain firing being active. And so we used to call that short-term memory because it doesn't last very long. Uh, but now we, we usually refer to it as working memory, though there are some scientists who like to argue and say it's two different things, but I, I don't care. <laughs> okay, so the next level of memory, of course, is called long-term memory. And these are memories that you store permanently or near permanently, and you can have them for your entire life. And as far as we know, there's no capacity to long-term memory. You can store infinite long-term memories, as far as we know. Whereas working memory, you can only keep a certain number of your neurons active at once, a certain amount of information active at once. Your long-term memory, as far as we know, we've never found a capacity for it. And it's not fragile. You can have long-term memories that last an entire lifetime. I remember my eighth birthday because my mom brought ponies. So that is something that I'm sure I will remember for my entire life. It's not fragile, that memory. So now I wanna talk a little bit in more detail about the, the two really important levels here that uh, for the purposes of this class. For the purposes of this class, sensory memory is not really something we're gonna spend much time on. For crit it doesn't really apply to critical thinking. But working memory does. So different people have different working memory capacities. That's how much information you can keep active in your brain at one time. And there's different ways to measure working memory capacity. So what we really want to do is see, you know, if there's one person who has a shorter working memory capacity versus another person who has a longer working memory capacity, and so one of the, the ways that cognitive scientists would measure a person's working memory capacity, and we still do, is by using something called a digit span task. And all this is, is where we say a, a list of numbers to you and ask you to repeat them back to us. How many can you repeat back to me? If I say five, nine, seven, three, two, eight, 10, if I say these different numbers to you, how many of those can you remember before you lose track? And it turns out that most people, their capacity is around seven items. You can remember seven numbers about before you start to fall apart. Most people can remember at least five items, and there are some people who have really large working memory capacity who can Remember, remember about nine items. So we call that seven plus or minus two. So that's the big uh, formula that you'll hear cognitive scientists say for your working memory capacity, seven plus or minus two. That means between five, that's seven minus two, and nine, seven plus two. So that's where most people are. 
If your working memory capacity is below a five, it indicates that you have some kind of uh, non-neurotypical thing going on. And if you have a working memory capacity above nine, it also means you're non-neurotypical, but in the positive direction, you have a very large working memory capacity. One of the things that humans do in order to increase the number of items they can keep in working memory is to do something called chunking. Okay, so this is something that we do for the digit span task all the time. So if you think about the way you remember your phone number, I remember my grandmother's phone number from the time I was a child. It was 7570564. At that time, you didn't have to dial an uh, area code when I was really little. <laughs> when I was really little, you didn't have to dial an area code if you were in the same area code. So we were both in the same area code. <laughs> and I would dial my grandmother's house 7570564 to talk to her. Now, that's seven digits, 7570564. But if you notice, when we're learning phone numbers, we chunk the numbers. So 757, that's one chunk, and 0564, that's another chunk. And nowadays, we would put an area code on it, too. So, for example, uh, at the first area code we ever had for all of the San Diego area, from the very south part of San Diego to the very north part of San Diego, it was all 619. So my grandmother's phone number, once we had to start dialing area codes, was 619-757-0564. So now I have three chunks of items, and it's easy for me to remember three chunks of items. So when we chunk items, now I actually have a digit span that looks like 10 numbers. Six, one, nine, seven, five, seven, oh, five, six, four. That's 10 numbers. That should exceed my working memory capacity, but it doesn't because I'm chunking the numbers. I'm putting the 619 together, the 757 together, and the 0564 together. And there are people who you'll see on television who seem like they have enormous working memory capacities. So these kinds of Sherlock Holmes characters where it seems like they're keeping a ton of information active in their brain at once. There's a, the person who had the longest digit span ever was a 79 digit span. So he could remember 79 numbers. But what he was actually doing was he was really good at chunking. What he liked, that that guy who could do it, he he liked to watch um, races. So um, human races, humans, uh, you know, doing the 50 yard dash or the thousand meters or things like this. And he would memorize the race times for his, uh, for the races that he, thought were the most important. He would memorize all these different race times. And then when he was looking at a new digit, a new list of digits to remember, he would look at them and remember them as the different race times of, you know, oh, this is when uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, you know, won the 1500 meters. Uh, It was this number of minutes. And so he was chunking those huge spans of digits into meaningful pieces of information. And what it turned out was that his his actual working memory, the chunks, were only actually a seven items. It was just seven items where each chunk had a whole bunch of numbers in it that he had memorized ahead of time. So that's how people seem to be able to do these amazing tasks. They have strategies for chunking. There are even people who are able to memorize a deck of cards as it goes by very, very quickly. They can memorize a whole deck of cards and you say, oh my goodness, that's so amazing. How do you remember 52 cards? And it's because they practice chunking the different cards. So, you know, that's this hand or that hand or whatever. And so they learn how to make it seem like they have a huge working memory capacity when it's actually just being really good at chunking. And chunking does take some attention. So it does take some attention to remember, oh, that's, you know, the guy who's remembering 79 digits. That's this race. That's that race. That's that race. And, you know, now I've got it together. This was the Olympics in, uh, you know, 19... 
84, and then this was the the world. I don't know anything about running either. I don't know anything more about running than I know about tennis. <laughs> I'm just making it up. Okay, so he. the point is he was very good at chunking. And generally speaking, the benefit of chunking outweighs the attention it takes. So yes, at first it took some attention to remember my grandmother's phone number had the 619 area code and then 757, I had to take some attention to chunk those numbers together, then 0564. But after I did that a couple of times, the usefulness of it outweighed any attention that I had to, had to um, deploy. And so we do this for so many things in real life. We chunk our social security numbers. We tend to chunk our student ID numbers. And anytime we have to memorize things, chunking is a very good way of remembering many different types of information. So it turns out that the larger working memory you have and you can practice to improve your working memory, the higher your working memory is, uh, the better you will be at tasks that require keeping different pieces of information active in your brain at the same time. So people who develop their working memory abilities are the people who are good at keeping a lot of things in mind when they're in class or when they're at their job or when they're interacting with family and children. These are the people who seem to have a lot of ideas because a lot of neurons are active at once. So this applies to a lot of different things that people do. When we're trying to reason through things and make logical decisions, when we're trying to read through information and really comprehend it, uh, when we're trying to practice for standardized tests, all of those things, having a large working memory capacity and having a lot of practice at using it makes it so that your scores will improve on those things. And you're also, people who have higher working memory capacities tend to stay on task better. They are less likely to experience mind wandering. Okay, so we've been talking about working memory. How do we get working memory into long-term memory? So I could talk a lot about the neuroscience of this, and I'm gonna, but I'm not going to talk a ton about it. I'm just going to kind of casually mention that what's going on in your brain as I talk about things that are kind of more intuitive to understand. So it probably won't be a surprise to you because your teachers have said it so many times, but information, so when you're engaging information, when you're encoding information, when you're acquiring memories, the best way to acquire a memory is to actively engage the information. So when you are reading your readings, actually taking the time to think about what you're reading while you read it, to think about the material and what the author is trying to say to you, makes it so that you are more likely to get that information into storage and therefore be able to retrieve it later. And one of the key findings of a ton of cognitive science research is that the best way to practice information, the best way to get information into our long-term memories is called elaborative rehearsal. So elaborative rehearsal is where we take information and we make connections in our brain between that new information and information we already have in our brains. So elaborative rehearsal is a very active process. When you're reading, you encounter new information, do you think about how that fits in with all of the other information in your brain? Do you think about how that makes sense? Do you make connections between that new information and old information? All of that is elaborative rehearsal. You're making more connections in the brain. The opposite of elaborative rehearsal is called maintenance rehearsal. And maintenance rehearsal is essentially where you just try to remember something by repeating it over and over and over again. So this might be children who are trying to practice spelling for a spelling bee. They might use maintenance rehearsal and just try to spell the words over and over and over again. Even though they don't know what the words mean, they might just be practicing the spelling. 
And it turns out that maintenance rehearsal is a very poor way of getting information into long-term memory. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Sometimes even if you meet that guy at the bar and he says his name is Bob and you repeat to yourself in your head, Bob, 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 a million times, five minutes later, you don't remember Bob at all. Holy cow, I repeated that name 10 times. How did I forget it? Well, guess what? That was just maintenance rehearsal. You just repeated it a bunch. Whereas if you said in your head, oh, I'm going to do elaborative rehearsal, it might go something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Oh, Bob. I once had a friend named Bob when I was in fifth grade. He was a really nice guy. Bob had brown hair just like you. You and Bob both had curly brown hair. Isn't that amazing? Now I'll never forget your name because I've made elaborative rehearsal. I connected that guy's name, Bob, to a Bob I knew in fifth grade, and I remembered that they both had brown hair and curly brown hair. Now, later when I see that guy in his curly brown hair, oh boy, I'm going to remember his name is Bob too. So this is all to say that intention, meaning I'm trying to remember this thing, actually has little or no effect on your ability to learn and remember. You can have all the intention in the world. So you can really want to remember that that guy's name is Bob. And you can be saying to yourself, Bob, 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 just remember it. And really intending to have that information. But you're not learning it the right way. That intentional information is not elaborative. You are not using elaborative rehearsal. You're just using maintenance rehearsal. You're using the wrong strategy. And so intention, sometimes incidental, what we call incidental learning, actually is easier to have than intentional learning. So I'll give you an example. If you walk in on your significant other cheating on you, you will learn incidentally that that person is cheating on you. You walk in, you didn't have an intention to learn, oh my goodness, today I need to learn whether or not my partner's cheating on me. You walked in and you learned it right away. Guess what? You're never gonna forget that. You're not gonna walk out and forget in a second that you're significant, you just saw your significant other cheating on you. So even though that was incidental learning, you're not gonna forget. Why? Well, because you are using elaborative rehearsal when you see that. As soon as you see your significant other cheating on you, a million thoughts go off in your head. Oh my God, am I going to get a disease? Oh my God, do I have to move out? Oh my goodness, what does this mean for our relationship? Oh, my parents are going to be so upset. All these things. That's elaborative rehearsal. You're not just repeating in your head, my partner's cheating on me, my partner's cheating on me. That would be weird. Okay, we don't do that. <laughs> so intention doesn't matter. It's all about making connections. The more you activate the connections in your brain, the more elaborate the connections are, the more connections you make and the, the more intense those connections are, the more likely you're going to be able to bring that information up later. We call those networks in your brain retrieval paths. So when you are making elaborative connections between information, when you are, your teachers have said this a million times, engaging the information, what you're doing is actually making connections in your brain. And the more connections you have in your brain, the easier it is to activate any part of that pathway and bring that memory up later. It makes it so that you have whole elaborate connections between your neurons that activating any piece of it can get you to the right information. And that's why studying in an elaborative way is so effective. Really thinking about the material and engaging with the material makes it so that when you are on an exam and somebody asks a question on an exam, which is how that works, right? You now have so many different places in your brain that if you just activate one or two of those parts, it's going to help you remember all of the different parts. That is what helps you do well on exams. And it's also what helps you do well in your job and in your life. When you've made enough connections in your brain that you can bring that information up easily, 
That's what we're hoping for you. That's why we're hoping that in this critical thinking class, you can make retrieval paths for critical thinking. So when you retrieve information from your memory, you're activating these neural networks. You're activating the actual cells in your brain. When we have done certain studies, we have found that the neurons that are active when you're learning something, when you're encoding a memory, when you're acquiring a memory, are largely the same neurons that you reactivate when you go to retrieve that information. So they've done tests where people, they've taken advantage of the fact that a person needed um, brain surgery. And they actually recorded which neurons were firing when people did different things. So for example, they asked a lady, she was going into surgery, and so they literally had the top of her skull open and they're recording the firing of the neurons in her brain, and they just had her watch a video. She's, she's watching a video, and it shows this the us landing on the moon, and it shows Niagara Falls and all these different things. She's watching the video. When they go back and they ask her to remember the different things, okay, now remember the waterfall, the same parts of the brain that were firing when she first looked at the waterfall fire again when she remembers the waterfall. And this is, uh, leads us to a saying that you hear in neuroscience a lot, which is that neurons that fire together, wire together. So if I can connect two separate thoughts and fire those neurons together for you at the same time, it's going to make a connection between those neural networks that will strengthen the more it's used. So, Neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have tried to give labels for these different um, parts of our memory network so that we can talk about them. Okay, so I'm going to explain some of these terms and how uh, they are part of the memory network. Okay, nodes. Nodes in the memory network you can think of as an idea. A node is an idea. So a node in your memory network might be the idea of a bird or the idea of a chair or the idea of school, okay? These might be all different nodes in your memory network. It's just an idea. And then associations are the connections between ideas. So how are birds connected to dogs? Well, they're both animals, okay? So bird might be one node dog might be another node, an animal might be a third node, and they're all associated with each other. They're all connected by the idea that we're talking about animals. And nodes that are connected to one another, if you activate one of them, it makes it more likely that all of the others in the area get activated. So for example, if I say to you, I'm gonna give you a list of words, honey, hive, buzz, pollen, flowers. Okay, so all of these different words are activating nodes in your head and they're all associated with one another. And so the activation level of all these different nodes is increasing. And when I say all those words to you, one of the words that might have occurred to you when I was saying all those other words was the word bee, because bees are connected to all those other words, honey, hive, buzz, okay, all of those things are connected to bee. And so even though I didn't say the word bee at first, all of the activation of the nodes around bee increased the, the activity in the bee node and got it to what we call its response threshold, okay? So if I had said to you before the words honey, hive, buzz, flower, pollen, all of those things were driving the B node up to its response threshold. And if you thought the word B before I said it, that means that you met the response threshold and that node fired and you thought B. If you didn't think the word B, what you had was called sub-threshold activation. 
the neuron for B, for whatever reason for you, wasn't stimulated enough by all of those other firings of the nodes around it. But maybe it would be if I did this. Let's, let's try a different one. Bed. Tired. Nighttime. Pillow. Exhausted. Now, I didn't say the word sleep, but if you thought the word sleep, all of the sub-threshold activations from the other word gathered together, that's called summating, they summate, they get together, and you thought the word sleep. Okay. So what we're saying is that different concepts are associated through these different nodes that they share in the brain. And there can be lots of associations that overlap in our brain. So for example, bird and dog, those two things overlap with animal for me, but bird and dog might also overlap for, let's say a person who likes to go hunting. They think of that immediately. So. What we're saying is in any person's brain, as you activate certain nodes, every other node that is connected through an association can be activated. And we call that spreading activation. And this is the idea of how we make all of our mental associations, how we connect things to one another in our brain. So if I say, let's think about all different kinds of transportation. You might start with car, but then you get to plane, but then you get to motorcycle and you get to skateboard. And then all of a sudden you think, oh my gosh, it was really fun when I went skateboarding the other day. And oh my gosh, I saw Joe and I really should call him. Okay, that's spreading activation. You're making all of these associations and it's spreading out through your brain. And the more cues you are given, for getting some kind of information, for retrieving some kind of information, the more likely it is that you're going to activate the memory that you want. So the more words I gave you for trying to get to the word sleep, the more likely it is that you would get to the word sleep. If I just say bed, you might think the word sleep or you might not. But if I said bed and tired, now it's more likely that you'll think sleep. And if I say bed, tired, exhausted, now it makes it even more likely that you get to sleep. The more cues you have, the better. You can also inhibit spreading activation. So for example, when we were talking about transportation, if I said to you, I want you to talk about transportation, but don't talk about any things that fly. I don't want you to mention any kind of transportation that involves flying. Okay, because we're only trying to think about transportation that's not in the air. So you inhibit those thoughts. You don't think about planes and helicopters because you're trying to think about cars and skateboards and other things. So we always, frequently, all the time, every day, use these different parts, these different abilities in our brain. Activation and inhibition. So we can, of course, make mistakes in our memory. We do it all the time. We make a mistake on a, a test, not because we didn't know the information, but because we couldn't retrieve it at the time of the exam. This, this is very common. I'm sure it's happened to you where you say, oh my goodness, I know the answer to this question, but I just can't get it right now. Well, where was the error? Was it during encoding? Did you actually not get it into your information, into your brain, that information? Was it at storage? Was it in there in your brain and then it got lost? Or is it retrieval? Are you just not getting enough cues to bring it back? But the point is that no matter where the error is, it all comes back to this web of other memories. It all comes back to this memory network, all of these associations. And yes, this is how we think of things in cognitive science, these nodes in our brain, but the actual wiring of our brain is similar to this. There are different areas of your brain that will reliably be activated when you are experiencing certain kinds of thoughts, certain kinds of memories. Like I said, when they recorded the activity of that woman's brain while her skull was open, when she was remembering, it was the same neurons firing as when she was acquiring the memory.
And in our brains, there are no boundaries between our neurons. When you have one neuron activated, everything else connected to that neuron can in turn be activated. There's no wall between one neuron and another. And that's why our brains can go into so many different directions. That's why when we do things like brainstorm, lots of different people will have lots of different ideas because their brains have put those memories together in different ways. And the more your connections overlap and the stronger they become, the more likely you are to retrieve information. So for example, the reason that you might automatically think the word sleep when I say the word bed and tired and exhausted is because you hear those words together so often. They overlap. And so you're more likely to bring up the word sleep when you're hearing a lot of words uh, associated with sleep. But it also makes it more likely that two ideas can bind together or be activated together that shouldn't go together. So for example, if later I asked you, oh, what words did I say in that list? If you say the word sleep, that word wasn't actually in the list. You made a mistake. So these are called intrusion errors. Intrusion errors are where we make a mistake in our memory and something other than the thing we're trying to recall, the thing we're trying to remember comes out. And tons of experiments tell us that this is the double-edged sword of memory. So if I give you a story, let's, let's say I'm talking to a kid for the first time and I tell them the story of the three little pigs. If I tell a story of the three little pigs to a kid, if I give them a little backstory first about the pigs and the wolf and you know where the houses are and how this was set up, it actually makes it more likely that they'll remember the story correctly. Later, when you ask them to tell you details about the story, you tell the kid, oh, can you tell me that story back? They're more likely to remember more things correctly about the story if you gave them the backstory first. In other words, elaborative encoding helps you to remember more things. But it also makes you more likely to have an intrusion error. It makes it more likely that you'll put something in to the story that wasn't actually there. Well, what's up with that? Well, it turns out that we have expectations in our brain called schemas. And schemas guide us through all kinds of situations in life. So for example, you have a schema for what occurs when you go and eat at a restaurant. You have a schema for expecting utensils to be a certain way and the server is gonna come out and talk to you and you're gonna sit down in the chair and you're gonna do all these different things. And that makes things generally easier. Imagine if every time you went into a restaurant, every restaurant did things totally differently and you had to figure out whether there were servers or whether you were gonna be given utensils or you should bring your own. Or if, you know, what was gonna happen? Is there gonna be a menu or am I gonna to have to ask? Okay, so if there were all these different choices, it would be really difficult to deal with them. But schemas help us so that you go into a restaurant, it's more or less the same thing most places you go. But it can also lead to errors. So for example, if I asked you to look at a scene and it was a restaurant, and then I asked you, I took the, away the scene and I said, remember as many things as you can about this. If you're talking about a restaurant scene, you're gonna describe things that are in the restaurant, tables and people and utensils and glasses and, and dishes and those kinds of things. But what if you said dishes and then it turns out there actually were no dishes in the picture? We are very likely to say things that have to do with the schema are there when they are things that go with that schema. We're more likely to add elements that are consistent with the schema, but actually weren't there. And we're more likely to leave out unusual things, things that are not usually remembered in the schema. So for example, you might not remember, oh, the lady had a red jacket. You might say, oh, there was a lady sitting there because that's consistent with a restaurant schema, but maybe not necessarily a red jacket. So you might omit those errors that are not necessarily concurrent 
with the schema for restaurants. And this applies to everything, whether you're talking about the schema for school or the schema for you know, what happens when you go on a hike or the schema of what's at the beach or all of the different ideas that you can have. So another problem that we can have in our memory, so we can have a, a situation where a schema makes it so that we make a memory error. We put something in that's not that's consistent with the schema, but not actually there, or we take away something that's not consistent with the schema that actually was there. Another thing that can happen to our memories is called the misinformation effect. And that's where we get information after the event that influences our memory of the event. So there was a really classic experiment done by a lady named Elizabeth Loftus, very famous memory researcher, probably the most famous memory researcher um, working today. Elizabeth Loftus did a very famous experiment where she showed people different kinds of car accidents. Okay, so they would watch videos, they're staged videos of car accidents. And then they would ask people questions about the car accident that they just witnessed on the video. So for example, they would show two cars uh, having an accident, and then they would ask you, was there any broken glass in the accident? Did you see any broken glass, any windows uh, that were broken or any other glass that was broken? And they all they did was ask two different groups the information two different ways. One way they said to the participants, did you see any broken glass when the two cars smashed into each other? And then they asked a second group, essentially the same question, but in a different way. They would say, did you see any broken glass when the two cars hit one another or contacted one another or bumped one another? And in every condition, there was no broken glass, but just the word used in the question influenced people to say that they saw broken glass more often, even when there was no broken glass. So in the case where they said, did you see any broken glass where the cars contacted each other? 44 people correctly said, no, I didn't see any broken glass. Six people said incorrectly, yes, I saw broken glass. When they said, did you see any broken glass when the two cars hit one another? 43 people said no, the correct answer. Seven people said yes, the incorrect answer. But when they asked the question, did you see any broken glass when the cars smashed into one another? People in that group said yes 16 times and said no 34 times. So the number of people who said yes, just by changing one word, it almost doubled, or no, more than doubled. It almost tripled the number of responses of people who said, yes, I saw broken glass. So that's the misinformation effect. Misleading information given after the event actually caused people to have false memories. How can we avoid memory errors? So of course, cognitive scientists want to know how can we make it so that we don't make these mistakes? Are there any ways to know if a person is having a correct memory or an incorrect memory? And so there were different factors that cognitive scientists studied to see if these factors went along with accuracy. And one of the first things they studied was confidence. They, if you ask a person, how sure are you that you're right? You can get a person who says, you know, how sure are you that you saw broken glass? Oh, I'm 100% sure. Or you can have a person who says, oh, I'm not very sure. And when you're in court, you're a judge, you're a jury, you're a member of the audience, the more confident the witness is, the more likely they are to be believed. So if a, if a witness says, I'm 100% sure I saw that, 
that person is more likely to be believed than a person who says, I'm not very sure. But as it turns out, most studies show that there is no relationship between confidence and accuracy when it comes to memory judgments. More confident people are not more accurate. So for example, let's say that you have a person in a task and let's say it's an eyewitness judgment, okay? So they view, a, let's say a simulated crime, okay? Somebody's getting their purse stolen on a video, okay? It's, it's pretend. And then after you watch this, this thing on this video, we ask you to tell us what happened in the video. So for example, what color was the purse, right? And then the person responds. They say, oh, it, the purse was yellow. Well, if the person who's giving the test says to that person, yes, the purse was yellow, that will make the person more confident that they were right. But it doesn't make them more accurate. If I tell you, yes, the purse was yellow, whether it was or it wasn't, it makes you more confident in what you said, even when you were wrong. And we call that confidence malleability. And this takes place all the time in police work. If a police officer is asking you to identify somebody in a lineup and you say, oh, it's number four, and the police officer says to you, yes, it is number four, even if you were unsure, your confidence will go way up. But that doesn't mean you were right. Just because you got feedback, what if the, per the police officers had the wrong suspect and they tell you, oh, you're right, but that wasn't actually the person at all. It's just the person that they suspect. So confidence malleability is a huge problem. People's judgments about their confidence might be very strong, but their accuracy might actually be very poor. They're not related to each other. So then the next thing that cognitive scientists said, well, what about emotion? Can, if you feel something really strongly, does that mean you remember it better. And it turns out, no. We see no relationship between how accurate people are with their memories and how emotional they are about their, those memories. People can have very uh, emotional memories that are true. They can have very emotional memories that are false. And then they, you can have uh, memories that don't have a lot of emotion that are true or don't have a lot of emotion that are false. Really, emotion is something that, to a large degree, we can separate from accuracy. So without other evidence, we really, with, unless we have objective evidence that tells us, oh, here's a video where you can see what happened, or here's a blood sample where you can see that this person was at point A and at point B. If we don't have some kind of other evidence, we really don't know whether a memory is real or false. We have no way of finding that out for sure in cognitive science. Is there any way that we can make it so that you're less likely to forget? Is there any way that we can, let's say that you, uh, you forget something, but oh, you forgot something at the test, but can we make it so that the next time you take the test, you don't forget. So let's say you studied for your driver's test and to get your permit, and the first time you didn't pass, you forgot a lot of the answers. The next time, if you study more, you're more likely to undo that and remember. So one of the best ways that we can avoid forgetting is to refresh our memories often. What does that look like? Studying. Studying repeatedly, refreshing those memories often, is the best way to make sure you don't forget. And one of the best ways to refresh your memories is actually to give you exams. Exams promote learning. So exams are not just a way to test you. They are actually a way to improve your memory. The more you are tested on information, the more likely you are to put that into long-term memory. Your professors are not being mean. 
by telling you to study and then giving you a little quiz and then asking you a question in class and then repeating that in a different way and then giving you an exam and then giving you a cumulative final. That's not your professors being mean. We're trying to give you information so that you can function better in the world, so that you can do your job better, so that you can make decisions more efficiently and effectively. So again, there are a few studies that say emotion can lead to better memory consolidation. So the way that they did some of these studies was they would have you try to remember things and they would put your hand in a bucket of ice water. And so they thought by raising your emotions, you'll remember these events better. And it seemed in some of these experiments that there was a little effect, but it could just be that when something's very emotional, we pay closer attention to that event. When we see, oh, we walked in on our partner cheating on us, we pay closer attention to what's going on than if it's something that doesn't have any emotional weight for us. We also tend to practice those things. You walk in on your, your significant other cheating on you, you think about it over and over and over in your head. You're rehearsing the information. You're perseverating on the information. So that might be one way that emotion is connected to memory. But if you think about it, that's really not so much about the emotion. It's about the attention and it's about the rehearsal. It's about elaborative encoding. It's not so much about the emotion itself, but it's how the emotion affects the other processes. Because there are some kinds of emotions or there are some kinds of memories that seem very emotional that are actually less accurate than they feel. So there's a kind of memory called a flashbulb memory. And a flashbulb memory is where something really unusual happens and then people feel like they have a very clear memory of this event. So for people who are my age, 9-11 uh, is one of those events. 9-11 where uh, the, the, the planes were flown into the World Trade Center uh, is something that you know, was really etched into our minds and it feels like a flashbulb occurs in our brain when we think about these memories. You know, other things that might be like that are when you're giving birth to your child or if you're in some kind of an accident. So all these things can be very emotional and then therefore you have a lot of feelings surrounding the memory. And people report a lot of confidence about these memories. They will say, I remember it like it was yesterday. I saw this and then I did this and it hit the first building and then the plane hit the second building and people feel very confident about these memories. But it turns out that flashbulb memories are no more accurate than uh, any other memory. People's memories for 9-11 are no more accurate than for other events that occurred in a similar way at a similar time that didn't have that emotional effect unless it's directly relevant to the person's life. So for example, if you were in the World Trade Center on 9-11 and you survived, if it was personally relevant to you, we are very good at remembering those things. And it's probably because we rehearse it a lot. We think about it a lot because it's personally relevant. And so we make those memory pathways more and more solidified. But it turns out that people who are very accurate at their flashbulb memories, they'll say, oh, I'm very confident. But people who are very inaccurate will also say they're very confident about them. So accuracy and confidence, again, they're generally not related to each other. And flashbulb memories generally, unless you were actually at the event, uh, feel a lot more accurate than they actually are. So. When all of this information is coming at you for this class and for your life, when you are trying to process good information from bad information, and there's just so much of it, there's so much of it on the internet, there's so much of it coming from people in our lives, it's everywhere, information, so much of it, what do you do? Well, I've given you some tools in this class, and that's where I'm going to leave you for uh, next week. 
you're going to look at your readings, which includes something called the crap test. And yes, it's hilarious. Is this crap or is this not crap? And then they use those letters to spell out the things that you should be looking for. So the crap test is just one page reading, and it tells you what the steps are to evaluate your sources. How timely is this in this information? You know, you look, what's the date on it? Is it from 1957? Is it from 1997? Or is it from 2017? Those are different things. Is this relevant to what you're looking for? You know, am I trying to research something about emotions and memory and I'm learning something about uh, emotions and uh, families, those two things might not, the thing about families and emotions might not be relative to what I'm trying to figure out about memory and emotion. So there are all these different aspects and you're going to read the crap test and you're going to think about it. You're going to do some elaborative encoding and say, oh, how could I apply that to when I'm looking up information on the internet? If I see something about COVID and I want to know if it's true or false, how would you look and see where the source is that you're looking at? How did, does it pass the crap test or not? There's a second source called Harris's Evaluating Internet Research Sources, and that is another, it's a couple of pages reading that you're going to read through. And again, it's going to give you tips and actual concrete steps for how you evaluate your internet research sources. So the crap test you can apply to kind of anything in life, whereas Harris's uh, evaluation sheet is more about specifically when you're trying to do internet research for a uh, school or work or a place where uh, really putting things together in ways with reliable sources is absolutely necessary and required. Uh, you know, because we can develop all kinds of informal sources for ourselves that we trust. You know, you might have somebody on the news who you trust all the time. But Harris's is really going to tell you, is that source something that's appropriate for putting in a research paper? In psychology, in the behavioral sciences, there's an entire course called Research Methods. Uh, at this school, it's Psych 230. And Research Methods is an entire class about how to sort through information that if you're going to get your psychology degree at the school, you're going to be required to take. So we have entire classes that can tell you how to evaluate uh, information. And the final thing is practice. Like everything in life, fighting information overload, the best thing you can do to fight information overload is practice. The more you practice, the more you find sources that you trust. The more you find places that you can go again and again that tell the truth that tell you things that are scientifically accurate. And then when you find those places, you know you can go back there and they are going to be that trustworthy source. But you also always have to keep questioning. Even when you find a source you can trust, sometimes things happen to make that source no longer trustworthy. So we always have to be questioning, is this still good? Is this still reliable? Or, you know, did the new, you, there's a newspaper that you really trust, but all of a sudden it changes ownership. And now they're saying things that don't seem right anymore. That kind of stuff really does happen. But the more you practice, the more you'll be able to spot that too. The reason that I've been asked to teach this class to you is because I have spent a couple of decades engaging in critical thinking. And not just informally, but formally for the purposes of my education. To get here, to get to the place where I can teach you this class, I've had to practice. I've had to practice critical thinking again and again and again. And now I have to break it down into a way that I can explain it to somebody who doesn't have as much experience as me. And that's not anything wrong with you. You guys are starting your college careers. And so it's completely appropriate that you're in a place where you should be practicing these skills and developing them. The more you've already done that, the more you've already actively engaged material and started to practice critical thinking, the easier and easier and easier it gets. So that's what we're going to be doing here. And so that's everything for this week. Make sure that you're doing your readings and listening to your podcast, watching your videos, all of the things that were posted in the readings for this week. 
and then make sure you finish out this video and take good notes on it. And if you need to watch it again, you can go ahead and do that anytime. All right. Thank you guys for listening. And I look forward to talking to you again next week and maybe seeing you during office hours too.